Parliament has now finally passed, both houses have passed the three new criminal law bills, which will replace the existing penal code of the country. A debate took place in the Rajya Sabha, again in the absence of suspended opposition MPs. And at the end, the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita, Bharatiya Nagrik Suraksha Sahita and Bharatiya Saksha Adhyanam have been passed. Listen in first to Home Minister Amit Shah. 18 Rajya, 6 Sangh Rajya, Supreme Court, 16 High Court, 5 Nyayik Academies, 22 Vishwavidyalai, 42 Sansad, और 135 आईपीएस अफसरों के लगभग लगभग 4200 सुझावों को एनालिसिस कर कर एक कानून बनाया गया है मैं नहीं मानता कोई कानून इतने विस्तृत कंसल्टेशन की प्रक्रिया से मानने वाले इसके बाद ये जब कानून बना तब मैंने खुद 158 बैठकों के अंदर बारीकी से पुराने कानून और नए कानून दोनों को पढ़ा है मानने वाले इसके बाद हमने गृह विभाग की स्टैंडिंग कमेटी को सौंपा इसी सदन से सम्मानीय सदस्य हमारे पूर्व डीजी साहब है उन्होंने बहुत अच्छा काम किया सभी सदस्यों ने जो विचार ये जो सुझाव दिए थे मैं आज सदन को बताना चाहता हूं इसके 72 प्रतिशत सुझावों को हमने स्वीकार कर लिया है नॉन पॉलिटिकल थे और सुझाव स्वीकार नहीं होते Okay, so let's focus on these laws. We are, we believe it is the biggest story of our times, not what happens to the, the mimicry is unfortunate, but this is the real story of our time because this will affect millions of Indians in the years ahead. New criminal laws. Now, while there are good points in the laws, there are some concerns as well. One particular aspect is what impact will it have on civil liberties because the police now have the power to seek 15 days custody at any time during a 60 to 90 day period before a charge sheet is filed. Current law allowed only 15 days custody during the first 15 days after arrest. So you are expanding police powers. Many therefore believe there is a possibility of greater abuse because provisions related to offences of terrorism, organised crime, endangering the sovereignty, unity and integrity of India could be misused by adding organised crime, terrorist offences, corruption under the new bill and not removing the laws that already exist for these offences like UAPA Prevention of Corruption Act will it lead to a greater overlap and experts say that are you really tinkering with long-standing established laws to only lead to an explosion of litigation? Is this only a cosmetic change, a name change? Today I'm going to hear two voices. The first one is Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi. He is the senior Congress MP and one of the country's leading lawyers. He joins me. Appreciate your joining us, Dr. Singhvi. In passing these three important legislations, Dr. Singhvi, new criminal laws, the Home Minister says he's ending a colonial legacy. That the Bharatiya Nagrik Suraksha Sahita has Indianized a colonial legacy of criminal laws. Do you accept that this was a much needed reform in our criminal justice system? Rajdeep, what has been done far from being much needed, is not required at all and is retrograde. What a law does is what matters, not rhetoric about colonial laws. A colonial law may be good and your modern law may be bad. And if the reverse is true, then the former must be amended and substituted by good law, not because it is colonial, but because you're bringing something good. This is a classic, classic case of Cosmeticism at its worst. Khoda pahar, shuya bhi And I will demonstrate to you immediately why. What was required, first of all, very, very cosmetic, much more so than you think. What was required by your structural, of course, laws require reform. They require out of need, not done at all. What is done in many, many ways, of course, I can't cover all the examples, is retrograde. And it is really but a ego-based uh, namkaran naming Me, exercise. No, no, uh, you must leave your imprint on any, everything. You must leave your identity on everything. Doctor, no, 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 Doctor Singh, we sorry to intervene. The fact is, you're using words like retrograde. You're saying it's cosmetic. It's ego-driven. But let's turn to specifics. Forget the rhetoric. We want to focus on the law itself. Now, for a long time, Dr. Singhvi, you know that those in the criminal justice system, whether police officers, judges, lawyers, all of them have been calling for reforms. The government says this is part of the reforms and they claim that uh, police powers are actually being controlled, will not be arbitrary and the laws itself are more citizen centric. Can you tell me when you say retrograde, be more specific? 
So Rajdeep, the devil and God both lie in the details. Let's take them one by one. Let me give you straight away three or four genuinely needed structural reforms not done. Mm -hmm. And let me then give you four or five done which are retrograde. Now, you mentioned just now police reforms. Mm -hmm. That's one of the... So this is actually a lost opportunity because of rhetoric and namkaran and, uh, you know, ego. Uh, police reforms have been talked about in innumerable law commission reports by three Supreme Court judgments called Prakash Singh, etc. The simple point there is separate genuinely by Chinese walls. Chinese not fashionable now, so Indian walls. The prosecution part and the investigation part. Have you done it? Mm -hmm. You lost the opportunity to do it. I would have welcomed it. You have the fantastic example, of course, an extreme example of the district attorney in the US. Mm -hmm. You have the director of public prosecutions in England. We have those posts intra-department, but they are meaningless because there is no genuine separation. And that what suffers is objectivity, transparency and impartiality. Just take an ordinary IO. You are a journalist of very senior repute. Uh, you know what a poor IO does? He gets up in the morning. Information he goes officer. into the field and collects evidence. Obviously, he gets attached to the limited evidence he collects. By 12 o'clock, he lands up in some court to do evidence. Comes home in the afternoon, comes to the office in the afternoon, sits in his own department with some seniors to decide whether the evidence he has collected should be prosecutable or not. And then files a report in the court. Now, this is completely apart from, of course, this is apart from doing his boss's bidding and, you know, doing menial tasks. Now, this is completely the antithesis of a good police department. They should have, as a first reform, not done, missed opportunity, uh, made these walls between the decision, between the collection of evidence and the decision to prosecute. Then, of course, the second one is to make it much more reformative, not punitive. You know, increase the number of compoundable offenses. There are innumerable number of petty, petty offenses which are not compoundable. Impersonating a public servant, some petty organized crime. I'm giving only examples because I don't have time to go into the details. But that is a reform I would have welcomed. Punishment alignment. You'll be surprised how many offenses are serious, but the punishment is minor. And vice versa. Align those things, you know, for bribery, for elections, you know, how much is the punishment? One year. And because you have an agenda in the love jihad, you've made a new offense, which I'll come to on the retrograde category, of 10 years. Riots provocation is six months. Do these alignments. Of course, this part, I must end by telling you one good thing they've done on this. And the good thing is that they've brought in community service as a punishment. Mm -hmm. I welcome that. I only say there that that list where you can award community punishment instead of incarceration mm -hmm. should be increased to many, many, many more offenses. But of course, should be excluded for second, third time repeat offenders. Both these last two things have not been done. Can I, can I, you, you, you're using the word retrograde again and again, and you used it interestingly just now in the context of love jihad, which you say could result in 10 years. They don't explicitly use the word love jihad in these new laws, but could result in 10 years of imprisonment. Could you give me an example, similar examples of why you believe these are retrograde? What is it about the way they've been uh, formulated that you believe are, it makes them retrograde? Five, four examples. And I'll be very brief because our time is limited. And there are, these are four out of many, many more. One, there is a section 69 added or a clause 69 still be passed. Sexual intercourse by deceitful means. Humongous disproportionate 10 year punishment. Astonishingly, the parliamentary committee which reported on it has put it under the head appreciated provisions leading to uh, involving love jihad. So clearly this is a disproportionate new offense intended for a particular agenda of the government. If you must have it, you already have rape by deceitful means. You don't have to have a separate offense with a 10-year punishment. And you know the laxity of prosecution, how you can be selective, how I can punish you and let off somebody else. Two major problems. And I have, for the life of me, not found the method in the madness, Rajdi. Anti-terror. You know there is a UPA, UAPA, that is an older special law it is directed and focused against terrorism. Mm -hmm. 
It has the three principles on anti-terror law, which are uh, harsh, but which I use for anti-terror. Reverse presumption of innocence, bailed more stringent, and statements admissible. Now in this, you have created a separate anti-terror part of this law. The funny part is that you have let it be decided by an SP as to whether you should apply the UAPA or this law. So the SP can pick and choose. The powers under UAP are more draconian, more harsh in favor of the prosecution. You have now a parallel system. And a SP chooses and worse, that SP chooses without any statutory criteria specified. I can't understand the meaning. Either you make some amendments to UAP which exists or scrap so, yeah. UAP, it's even better and make it more humane as partly you've done in this one. But having both some hidden agenda, some I, I can't find a reason. Exactly the same thing has happened with a slight difference in anti-organized crime. You know that all these states have this law, Kakoka, Makoka in Maharashtra, uh, you know, Haryana, Punjab, Rajasthan, my state, all of them have these state laws. They have similar stringent provision of reverse presumption of proof, bail and anti-bail, I mean, more stringent on bail and admissibility of statements. Now you've gone and created again a similar code of the mega all India IPC, now known as BNS, for an anti-organized crime law. Now, again, there is no method in the madness. First, unlike the anti-terror provision, there is no provision telling you whether the prosecutor will choose the state law or this law. He would normally prefer the state law, which is more stringent. It will allow selectivity. It will not tell you whether Rajdeep should prosecute me for which reason under X and prosecute somebody else under the other law Y. There is no criteria specified, which is given in the anti terror part of the BNS. And the worst tragedy, I say it in a lighter vein, the government is of course not guilty of sedition. It cannot be. But it is guilty of betrayal. On 11th May 22, as far back as one year ago, the Supreme Court put a stay. On 24th of uh, October 23, I'm sorry, 31st of October 22, they reiterated and recorded the statement of no less than the Attorney General saying we are seriously reconsidering. Suddenly, one year later, on 24th of May 2023, the Law Commission comes up with a direct recommendation for sedition and the government interestingly distances itself. says, we don't know. This is a Law Commission. It's an independent body. That, of course, was uh, meant for those who eat grass. But then now, in this law, it is nothing but the same sedition law. Mr. Honorable Home Minister is wrong when he dresses it up as Deshdro and not Rajdro. That one, the earlier one, had life for three years. This has life for seven years. It's the same law reincarnated. And more than that, after Supreme Court assurances, what is the, uh, what is the weight of the assurance to Supreme Court in the future if you act like this? And one last thing on this, you know the actual practice on the ground. You are arrested in Gujarat by Assam police on sedition charges. You are a journalist in UP and you are booked up in sedition charges. And every will give you a lecture and a sermon. Oh, if you have a good case, the law will take its own course. You will win. Not telling you that the process is the punishment. It's good enough to stay in jail for three to six months. And then, of course, you'll get some relief sometime. You know, Dr. Singhvi, I respect your legal acumen, which is why I allowed you to look specifically at this. But, you know, you said you started this by saying that this is a missed opportunity for the government. But the fact is, it's a missed opportunity for you as well. You could have debated this in Parliament. Instead, you're part of the group now, which of MPs, which are suspended. The disruption of Parliament has meant that the country has been denied a wider debate. You want to lead that debate. Rajdeep, Rajdeep, personally, I am anguished because on a lighter vein, I'm the only male who has been aborted twice. I was the lead speaker last session on the election commission bills about it. And this session on these three, I was opening the debate today about it. But ask the question, for what is this happening? For a simple statement by the Home Minister of the country or the Prime Minister of the country about a parliamentary breach. So who is showing ego? Who has a preconceived agenda that look, 
A, we will function from the mountain tops with ego and not budge an inch. We will not give a statement, though we will speak about it outside. B, the moment you protest about why you are not speaking, we will go to the extreme step of suspending you. C, have placards never come in parliament before? But have you had 141 suspensions ever before except one incident of 69 people for a totally different reason? Four, you are happy to go along each day and decide this in an empty parliament. Might as well not have parliament in this debate. So you have to decide who's to blame. We are not doing it joyfully. I am fully prepared to argue this today. I was going to be the lead speaker at 2 o'clock. Do you think I'm very happy at missing it? But if you do Tana Shahi, dictatorship of this kind, and you expect us to come into the house and say, okay, he did not make a statement, but the house should not, not listen. What, what if you don't listen to us? The smallest possible request which should be given by, for the asking in the last 75 years of the parliamentary history, minus, 40, minus 10. And to get another side to this continuing debate on these three new criminal law provisions, I'm joined by Pinky Anand, former ASG and someone who's worked with the Modi government. Appreciate your joining us, uh, Pinky Anand. The basic charge against these three bills is that while it changes the name of the Indian Penal Code and Criminal Procedure Code, the name change suggests that you're dramatically changing the laws in effect, actually. You've only tinkered with it. Most of the law is cut and paste. And worse still, it gives even more draconian powers to the police and the state, especially when it comes on issues like sedition and terrorism. Your take. Uh, well, you know, whenever you amend a law, whenever you bring about a new law, whenever you change the law, some allegation or the other is always made of the kind that you've just espoused. So basically, it's, it's difficult to say this. The point really of bringing a new law is that if you amend the law, it tends to have various possible contradictions, some ethos that you don't want to repeat. You want to translate the whole into an anti-colonial, not anti-colonial, but something which has lesser colonial deference or removing that element from our textbooks so that we have our own laws. So the concept of amendment, as I said, is one concept and the amendment of bringing in a new law because all said and done, there have been dramatic changes. So the dramatic changes, for example, I mean, let's take forensics. Let's take IT evidence. Let's take investigation with that. And I'm, I'm not sure about this draconian part. In any case, this is always the position in criminal law that you do need to give police powers. It's not as if you can't. Either you remove that, but that element is not possible to be removed. And what you are doing, for example, is safeguarding. So let's say electronic evidence. When you're permitting a device to take in electronic evidence or you're allowing forensics, which incidentally we need desperately by now, times have changed. We no longer have to really go around the whole way without dealing with forensics. And we have constantly been arguing for forensics into the system. So you are bringing in those elements and possibly another way was, as you say, to do something else with amendment of the law. But amendment of laws also has its own constraints and limitations which the new bills have sought to bypass as well as change the complexion by making it something which goes away from the colonial history you know, and the yeah. renaming of the acts, which has brought into focus. In fact, I find some of the changes are substantively extremely desirable. Okay, give, me give me one example. Give me one example, Pinky Anand. Give me one example of a change that you find desirable. As I said, just now forensics, investigation by electronic evidence, outright uh, giving of bail, Changing the complexion of terrorism to make it not anti-government but anti-country, uh, which I'm sure there could be literally no opposition to. So there's no uh, removing sedition as such from the textbook. I mean, in any no, case, it, it hasn't removed book. sedition. You see, this is this is the ingenuity of these laws. You haven't removed sedition. You've you've actually brought in sedition. Plus, many would say actually in the new defi uh, uh, definition, the government will have even more sweeping powers. Uh, to arrest someone un under sedition with much more severe penalties. Similarly, when it comes to police custody limits on bail, expanded police custody for a duration within 60 to 90 days post arrest and limited relief in bail, bail procedure. So how is this going to be? No, I, I don't know what you mean by limited procedure. For example, let me just share with you, Rajdeep. When you talk about, for example, releasing a person who spent half his term uh, of the offense mm -hmm. in jail should be released on bail. 
that is a straight away release that you have you've had time limits put down on the various trial procedures the idea has been to give speedier justice so that you can see the end of a trial mm-hmm. rather than the prolonged trials that actually carry on i mean you can you can always find fault as i said on the on the part of the police having powers in cases of sedition which is against uh, the country mm-hmm. in cases of terrorism which is against the country by in fact making it stricter to the extent of limited not stricter but limited in application in its own way and not extending across service you say that's become draconian i mean this argument doesn't seem to be that palatable at all no but you don't think that these laws will in eventually enhance discretionary powers of police what we actually needed was police reform instead the government has gone in for legal reform that too as i said according to legal scholars cosmetic because 90 to 95% is very similar to the old law you give it a new the uh, indian name doesn't make it a new law but the point is instead of withdrawing the discretionary powers of police and reforming the police this could be misused sorry, by the uh, police Ra- radeep radeep i'm sorry i mean much as we all talk about uh, police reforms and limiting the powers of the police i'm afraid how do you really achieve that accepting for safeguarding so that's why i say forensic electronic evidence that by itself limits to the extent Did mm-hmm. you have it supported by evidence which is what you drastically need today we've been living on a period of circumstantial evidence or direct evidence you have forensics which will, when it is there prove it conclusively so you know this whole hogwash about saying don't give police powers police will have powers mm-hmm. that is the agency police reforms yes police reforms are required but while they are pending you can't say that the law doesn't require so you know these negative kind of arguments to say no do that first then do this this is not the manner in which things are done however what we did need into place is the acceptance of electronic evidence forensics these these actually expedite procedures into a much speedier system that we are talking about today so so when for example critics are suggesting that it will give arbitrary power to label even non violent democratic action as terrorism you already have uapa now clause 11111 uh, of the of the uh, bns ipc widens the definition many believe of terrorism and it could include even a, a non violent act or a mere expression of speech or writing so these concerns are they valid particularly being expressed by human rights activists i i'm afraid that there is a wide schism between human rights activists and terrorism i mean terrorism cannot be condoned at any cost in whichever manner it comes across and that's my clear view i don't even think that this constant criticism or critique of terrorism is an activity which i don't think def- deserves much defense much as human rights activists may want to do so mm-hmm. so i have my fundamentals rather clear on that point what about the erosion of privacy rights with increased authority to seize digital devices as evidence you mentioned that you believe that it is important to have uh, uh, forensics as evidence uh, there are those who believe that this could be a violation of privacy rights if my mobile phone for example is seized and used as evidence uh rajdeep again i think we have to understand the fundamentals of fundamental rights when you are having two possibly conflicting fundamental rights there has to be a balance between the two and the balance doesn't mean that privacy wins on all counts if it is a question of an offense if it's a question of a criminal action there is no question of the privacy being intruded that it doesn't work in that fashion privacy has to give way to concerns of a higher order for example security health uh, like covid for example it was said that you couldn't have an app which went into whether you had covid or not but you could and you should you cannot bypass these procedures for the sake of this count of privacy if somebody is going to commit an offense and the mobile phone actually has evidence of that and that is sees where is the question of privacy privacy doesn't come into play on such counts i'm afraid okay pinky anand giving us the other perspective and we will continue these debates because we believe that these are the real issues of our times that need to be debated on news today we will continue to hold those in power accountable